Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Pal Ottawa. Our, I'm sorry. Welcome to Pal Ottawa's online arts festival spotlight 2021. I'm your uh, host today, David Globerman, uh, coordinator of supporting cast with Pal Ottawa. Uh, before we get started, uh, and I think you've probably all done this, I would ask that you make sure that your video is muted as well as your uh, microphone. That's just to ensure that the um, demand on the on the uh, broadband isn't too high. And uh, also in terms of the background noise, that's why you're muting your microphone as well. And also if you could uh, put your cell phones on vibrate as well. Um, Palo Ottawa would like to um, acknowledge the generous support of the New Horizons program, Employment and Social Development Canada for uh, this arts festival and, uh, and the upcoming presentation. Uh, we will be entertaining um, uh, questions for Marg. Um, I would ask that you submit them through the chat function. And there will be uh, periodic moments uh, during the session when Marg will uh, be directly interacting with the audience. And you can certainly uh, forward your, your questions through the chat line at that point, or you can save them, save them up until the very end of the presentation. And, um, and we can try to answer them as best as we can. Um, for those of you that are new to, new to Palo Ottawa, the organization provides arts workers 55 and over with affordable housing, which is a big problem in large Canadian cities, as well as health and social supports in a caring and creative uh, community. And this keeps us really, really busy because we're, we're trying to serve the needs of our constituents, constituency as much as possible. Um, I don't know if you know, but most arts workers are, are not making a lot of money. They're living at, you know, at or below the poverty line, which is about $18,000 a year, which is really not very much, very difficult to live on. So our programming uh, that we provide um, is, you know, supports our community um, in terms of providing, you know, education, and enlightenment and, and entertainment. But at the same time, it gives an opportunity for arts workers in the Ottawa community to earn a living and, and, uh, and showcase their talents. Um, so I'd like to give you a little, just a brief introduction on our feature pre presenter today. Um, Mark Boyle is a Metasage from Gaspe, Gaspe, Gaspesi. Her ancestors are Mi'kmaq, Abenaki, European and African. And thus she attempts to honor them all through both the work she does in community and through the arts she creates and, and performs. Mark has made a commitment to the arts, making, making uh, the arts toxin free, eco friendly, and sustainable. She's an artist, a craftsperson, a drummer, traditional dancer, writer, and workshop provider, a full spectrum doula, and a vintage shop owner. So that keeps Mark very busy, obviously. So without any further delay, let's give a warm round of applause, even though Mark can't hear you because you've muted your microphones, to Mark Boyle. Mark can't hear you. Okay, what I wanted to say was, well, Lalin, first of all, can you hear me now? Yep. Okay, well, Lalin to the organization for inviting me to uh, present today. I taught art for 30 years in the school system and also for 10 years at the Ottawa School of Art. And uh, during that time, I kept a lot of sketchbooks and a lot of that related to the idea of um, visualization and also um, visioning. So I pre prepared a slideshow basically to keep me on track and uh, to help me explain some of my thoughts in terms of traditional knowledge that relates to that, that um, need for adults and youth to um, have a sense of their spiritual path or sacred path. And um, that, that traditional knowledge is knowledge that's been passed by elders. And then I'm gonna talk about my artwork and then I'm gonna get you to do some activities that come from the field of um, writing and art for self-development. So I'm gonna try to share my screen. 
see if I can get this to work. Little patience, my, my laptop is very slow. Um, I did do some, took some stuff off of it to make it a little faster today. So in terms of, of sharing traditional knowledge, we don't use PowerPoints, we don't use slideshows. Um, when we go to the lodge, we sit and Mother Earth and we listen to elders speak and they speak from their heart um, for the context of a zoom uh, festival probably if we were in person i wouldn't have a powerpoint but um, in person um, it's different i wanted to try to make this a little more visual and um, introduce you to some of the artwork that i have done that's completely from visions during prayer and during ceremony and um, during uh, teachings in the lodge so the first overview is we're going to talk a bit about visualization and visioning in traditional knowledge uh, we're going to discuss some of my artwork and um, then you're going to do some activities that are grounded in art and creative writing they're they're from a couple of sources one is um in the 80s there was a huge movement in education for uh, self-concept development to build up students self esteem and their strength by having them do artistic activities that related to themselves and their vision for the future. And also I did some uh, master's courses, one of them was uh, writing for self development, which is in the in the field of writing therapy. And I'm not a trained therapist, but I have taken some art therapy workshops as well, because it's an interest of mine. So materials were that you need handy is some paper, some pencils, pencil crayons, etc. I've got my bins too. When we do acti activities, I'm gonna I'm gonna doodle. And um, if you want to share, the way we're gonna do it is David is gonna monitor the chat, so you can let him know, hey, I want to share something I just drew. Um, because I'm used to doing workshops where I'm in a room with people, I'm used to circulating and seeing what they're doing but that's not gonna happen on Zoom. So it's up to you to decide if you want to share what you're doing. Also, if you have questions, there's certain points in the presentation where we plan that David's gonna check the chat to see if there's questions. So basically the workshop is broken down into traditional knowledge, my artwork, some exercises in art, some exercises in writing, and then a little explanation of why I decided to do a follow-up session in a week from now. new out to the, the mountains, the Rockies, all of those related um, nations had traditions of naming and traditions of clans. And why I chose to put this is the naming ceremonies that um, were protected by some elders and are, in, are being uh, revitalized right now are very important for a person to have a sense and a vision of their future and their responsibilities in life. So traditionally, um, one of my uh, elders, who's Algonquin, had said when she remembers uh, a naming ceremony. So you ended up with more than one name. And the way I think of the name is a name that my ancestors know me by, the, my, the name that my spirits know me by. Um, so if you look at the top artwork, that's my adult name. I received it in the Medewin Lodge, and it's my visual um, art piece about me understanding that name. So my spiritual name is Kichitwa Wiziwin Niskandagwe Wanoje. That's my uh, youth name, which means a uh, sacred woman who has a mane. And my adult name that I got in the lodge, Medewin Lodge, is Nagiza Megazi Ikwe. I was given it to her by a Cree grandmother, who's the grandmother of that lodge. 
And it means Eagle Woman Who Flies Outside the Universe. So that artwork is me trying to have a sense of, uh, of uh, I guess, a vision to guide me as to who I'm meant to be um, based on that name. Another thing traditionally we had was clans. A lot of people still know their clans. Some nations pass them down through lines that are matrilineal, meaning from their mother, their grandmother, their great grandmother. Some uh, do it through patriarchal lines and also through ceremony. There are, because of what happened to us through cultural genocide over 500 years, there are families that don't know their, their clans. They might not even know, they might know their grandmother was um, First Nations, but they might not know where they're from until they do some some uh, ge genealogical work to find those those links and even then they might find their community and the people in the community might not remember whose clan they belong to so there are elders who have gifts and i've i've witnessed this many times in ceremony both in the midday lodge and elsewhere where elders um, help a person find their traditional clan a clan in algonquin is dotum and i want to uh, state that it's important living on unceded territory. I think we just lost Mark. Mark, it's David, can you hear me? can't hear her. David, um, we need to yeah. ask her to sign back on. Yeah. Um, let me just get to her. Sorry, folks. These things happen with, uh, with an older laptop. Okay, hi. Hi, Mar. Uh, we, we lost I lost you. my link. Yeah, I lost my link. So what I'm doing is I'm signing in on my desktop to share the screen and then I'll talk on my phone. Okay. So I just have to share the screen on there. It'll take me a few minutes. I'm sorry about that. It's technology. No problem. So I've turned the sound off of my computer. I'm going to share the screen there. Then I'm going to talk on the phone. Sure. Sounds good. We can hear you. So everything's working. So can you tell me? Oh, yeah. I think it, it's loading. loading. Right? It's loading right now. Yeah. Sorry about that. My laptop is actually only a year and a half old, but for some oh. reason, right now, it's diving a lot. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, we can see your slides. Okay, so the bottom artwork of mine is about my clans. So my clan is Gitku in Mi'kmaq and Megazi in Algonquin. And basically, it's Eagle Clan. So Eagle Clan has a traditional responsibilities of leadership and visioning. And, um, I've chosen to put two eagles because uh, the Boyle name in, is uh, from the Scottish Boyle clan and our shield is also two eagles. So I find it kind of interesting that both my European side and my Mi'kmaq side have the same um, bird. So I chose to do a series of artworks. The background have images of the universe. So this is the um, representation of the eagle nebulas, which are in, out there in, our, in space which fits with my adult name of Eagle Woman Who Flies Outside the Universe. 
Another key teaching that I think is about visioning is the teaching of times of life. So this medicine wheel I originally uh, learned from um, a Métis artist, Graham Thompson, who used to do, he did a 30 day partnership with me in a school I was teaching in. But then I was also introduced it, to it again um, through some elders who came to the Wabano Center. So seasons of life is basically about how we have phases that we go through in life and each part of that time of life has specific um, things that we're focusing on. So in the spring when we're, we're babies and toddlers is the time of nurture when we should be in a nest of comfort and caring and love. And then the time of vision is actually the summer of life. That's the time of youth. So traditionally when a girl started her first moon time, her menses, she would uh, in a lot of First Nations, and I'm, I can't generalize because every nation's different, but here in Algonquin territory, there was a berry fast and, an, a, and a young woman went into isolation with her aunties, her grandmother, her mother. Uh, traditionally, we had moon lodges a, apart from the community for when women were on their moon time. Also in that summer of life uh, was the first time people did fasting. So fasting on the land, and a lot of us are reclaiming that and reconnecting it at, later in life. We're not doing it as an adolescence, because right now we're in a time in our, in our nations of uh, reconnecting and revitalizing traditions that had to go into hiding. They were in hiding for about 100 years because of laws that made it illegal for us to do our ceremonies. So that time of vision for some people is ongoing. Um, people do fast later as well. They fast before they receive um, spiritual bundles, before they get new responsibilities, et cetera. The time of the path is the time when some of us um, as adults are following a, a path or responsibilities using the gifts we were given. And also then the, the final phase of life is the time of the elder when you're sharing your knowledge with younger people um, as a grandmother, uh, um, as, a, as a grandfather, as an auntie, as an uncle. And it's also the time to prepare for that transition to the next um, phase, which is the spirit world after your physical body dies. Um, so fasting and visions uh, is traditionally something that was done very specifically with specific protocols. And a lot of those um, traditions are being reclaimed and the people that protected them for several hundred years have come out of hiding and are now doing those ceremonies again with larger groups of people. So we're seeing a lot of fasts, we're seeing a lot of people on the land um, and those fasts help you uh, focus on the spiritual. So what my work is grounded in that traditional knowledge but also because I was an educator and I did other kinds of training than traditional training. Um, some of what I'm going to introduce is not Indigenous. It's not specifically tied to um, the learning I've had from elders from different First Nations. So my artwork over the last few years, as I started to get ready to retire from full-time teaching, I taught visual arts, Indigenous studies, and uh, later ESL. Um, as I started to get ready to retire, I started to make more art. And I started really small after a school day, coming home and making little artworks that were a few inches uh, in size. Um, and then I started doing bigger. Now that I've retired, I've been able to have the time to do larger pieces. So my spiritual path, as I say, that's my responsibilities, have come from dreams and they've come from ceremonies and they've come from elders. So elders would have told me, you need to now start doing this. Or when I became a community pipe carrier, I was passed that responsibility by somebody um, in the community. And all of that idea of what my responsibilities are is a spiritual path that really starts at birth and goes beyond death. It's responsibilities to family, to community, to the nation and the natural world. The images on this screen all relate to the eagle and condor prophecy. I was having dreams um, and also visions in the Medewawin Lodge and outside sweat lodges and inside sweat lodges from 2004 of me having to travel to South America and having to learn from the other nations in North, Central and South America. So 
if you look at the drum that's on the screen, the drum is a traditional canoe and it's um, also I've been told by some uh, Quechua Inca people that they think it looks like the boat from Lake Titicaca, but I haven't been there yet. Um, it represents so South and North working together as Indigenous people. The prophecy of the eagle and condor that I was dreaming, I didn't know what I was seeing. Um, and then I met elders who were able to tell me. Uh, it's a prophecy that goes back about 2,500 years. It's, it's an old prophecy like the Seven Fires prophecy, which is in this area. <laughs> and it talks about um, a time when the planet is in... Um, in a dire need for people to take better care of it because the planet is not going to sustain a human and mammal life if we don't make changes in how we live. And the vision showed me of going towards the sun, uh, the eagle flying with the condor, the big canoe, which looks like a Mi'kmaq canoe, but also I've been told looks like the Titicaca canoe. So my process is when I'm having these visions or uh, dreams or I'm doing a pipe ceremony and I, I get images that come across, I sketch them quickly. So the little drawing on the bar is actually the sketch on the spot. So that's what I did. And then afterward, I did it in pen and then afterwards I painted a little bit. And then since then I've been using that imagery. I used it in the logo for the Eagle and Condor Collective, which is a group that I founded with some other Indigenous people who live in Ottawa. And also the drum is the image of the Rainbow Warriors, which comes from the flag of the Quechua people. And that's, the prophecy is that a million Indigenous people will rise up, they'll reclaim their languages, they'll reclaim their culture, they'll learn their traditions, and they will become strong advocates for the planet. If you look at some of the um, last few years in terms of defending the planet, planet from the petroleum industry, defending the planet from mining all across the Americas, you'll see that indigenous people and their allies are leading um, basically a war of words and a war of spirit to protect the planet so that our children and our grandchildren still have it. So those images that you're seeing are my visual um, representation of those visions. And they were in dreams, like at night having dreams, but also visions that came uh, lying down outside of the sweat lodge, in a sweat lodge, in the, in the bidet lodge, all of those times the same messages were coming. And so that's why I took that guidance from my ancestors to start the Eagle and Condor Collective, which is a collective of artists, knowledge carriers, musicians, dancers, uh, all of whom are from uh, either a First Nation in Canada or an Indigenous nation in Central or South America or their Métis or Métisage. Um, or mestizo is how it's um, said in South and Central America. Also over the years, I was uh, really blessed to run a lodge in a high school when I taught indigenous studies, that was at Rideau High School. And I had had this sense that it needed to happen. An, an elder who's passed on, um, William Commanda had for six years had me work with the children at his spiritual gatherings. And when I ran that lodge, I had elders coming in uh, pretty much every week. Um, in one year, school year alone, I had about 40 different sessions with elders, knowledge carriers, and I got to learn from them. So it was my job. I was being paid, but I got to learn from uh, knowledge carriers. And I also had um, a blessing in 2006 of, of drumming at the Indigenous Coalition on the Environment Conference where elders from across North America were brought to Ottawa to talk about global warming, to talk about the changes that were coming. And as I've learned from elders, I always sketch. So the artwork you're seeing is the final artworks, but in my sketchbooks for the last 25, 30 years, I've been sketching while I learned from elders. And I do it in the lodge. I don't take notes, we're not, it's not how we're supposed to learn, but I do take I do do little drawings. Um, and after I finish a ceremony, if I do a pipe ceremony, I also draw the messages that are coming for other people. And so that's a practice that I've done for a couple of decades now. And then I've started, I had a little show with the School of Art when I was teaching there that these artworks are from, which um, is what 
um, I call the wampum tell us. One of the elders that spoke was William Commanda, the elders from the States. They all talked of a time when Mother Earth was going to start to send us messages that she was not happy with how we as humans are walking on this planet. Um, our original instructions as human beings is to live in harmony with the natural world, and that's just not happening. So these artworks were all from a show, um, and they were drawn in a sketchbook as elders spoke, and then painted. Um, some of them were done in grease pencil on rice paper layered on canvas, and some of them are acrylic paintings. Since that time, I have switched from I don't paint with acrylics anymore because they're petroleum byproducts and also because as somebody who's worked full time in the arts since 1980, uh, my health uh, has developed some sensitivities to any toxins. So I don't use acrylics or oil paints anymore. I only use um, pencil crayons, Stadler markers. They're the only toxin free fine liner on the market. I use corn-based paint that I order from the States. In the States, there's stricter laws on chemicals in art products for children up to 12. Canada doesn't have any laws. So in the States, you can source paint materials that have no toxins in them. There's no petroleum products in them. And so they're expensive, but that's what I work with now. I've also started a series um, that I call uh, We Dream in Circles. And our way of interrelating relating to each other traditionally that we're getting back to is a circular approach to life where we all are part of that circle and none of us uh, should be uh, more important than others. A child can share, and I learned this teaching kindergarten, that a child can share with you wisdom that you had never thought of as an adult. And so although we respect elders, we also, also respect uh, the insights that children bring, that youth bring and that adults bring. So this circular um, series of artworks that I'm hoping to have a show of at some point um, is all coming from prayers and from pipe ceremonies and from prayer, prayer in the lodge. And I'm doing them in um, fine liner with pencil crayon. So what I would like to do now, if there's any questions, David will, um, Come, up, come on and if there's any questions, put them in the chat at the top and then David can ask if you ask you to uh, to do that. Mark, I think we lost you again. Can you hear me? Uh, now I can, yeah. Okay, I'm gonna just try the video. I don't know why, I think it's maybe I'm using two devices with the same email account. So what I had said is if there's any questions, people can put them in the chat about the artwork or about any of what I've talked about so far. So I see that somebody had asked about um, putting on uh, auto captioning. I don't know how to do that. We don't have that, whoops. We don't have that capability right now, oh. but um, so there's nothing we can do about it right, you know, for this presentation, but hopefully in the future, we will, do, we'll, we'll get that going if we can. So one thing that um, I put up is my website. I've already posted uh, all, almost all of the screens from this presentation under presentations and workshops on my, um, on my uh, website. So I have a little section. Oh, okay. So Teresa is uh, offer, showing something documentation, ITS. So David can look into that. 
Well, I don't think we can, I think we don't have that capability through normal Zoom. I don't, I don't, I don't know anything about that. I'm not a tech, sec, okay. tech expert, so I'm not okay, the guy so. to do it. But okay. we as the organization, we'll look at some, we'll see if we can get that uh, obtained in the future. So there's a question from Karen about groups in Georgia area that are concerned with the preservation of, of the earth. And I'm not, I'm not, oh, I'm not knowledgeable in that area. I did do volunteer work for about three months at Koinonia, which is a farm outside of Atlanta. But um, uh, if there's anybody else from Georgia here who can answer a question, that would be great. So the next thing we're gonna do is some creative, what I call creative purse. It's a term I came up with for short activities that um, help you connect to, in our case, we would say to the spirits of our ancestors, to the people in the spirit world to guide us. Um, however you see that within your own worldview is up to you, but it's visual imagery that comes from both the subconscious and from prayer. And it's quick creative activities that help you visualize. So we're gonna, what we're gonna do is I'm gonna explain it, then I'm gonna give you some time. Um, when, uh, I'll probably give you five or 10 minutes per activity. And then you can again put into chat if you would like to show what you've done. So the first thing we're going to do is I'm going to guide you through some deep breathing and then I'm going to ask you to do um, an outline of the energy of your body. It sounds kind of strange, but um, we have a tradition, the Medewa Winini and Medewa Win Ikwe are energy healers. They're people that heal through the use of the energy um, and through prayer. And we believe that everybody has an energy pattern. Uh, each person's is unique to themselves, but also plants have an energy and animals have an energy, rocks have an energy. And it's kind of interesting because Western scientists just actually caught up to that, that traditional knowledge. Um, now there's cameras that can um, actually show the aura of a plant, the energy field around the plant. And there's nutritionists who um, have started to do theory on how the energy of specific plants can heal people. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get you to close your eyes and get out your sketch, get out your sketchbook, have it ready or uh, blank paper, whichever is comfortable. Have pencil crayons ready, have a pencil ready. Again, whatever you're comfortable with. I like to draw with ballpoint, but other people like to draw with pencil. And I'm going to um, talk through some breathing exercises. And then what I want you to do is uh, outline of your body in um, whatever colors come across as, as your energy. And that's sounding a little um, strange, but I've seen in the lodge people who have incredible gifts to heal other people. And they call on the energy of our ancestors, but also energy from the universe to help people heal. And the, I think the closest in Western science to that is probably um, people who do, uh, there's a, a master's degree that um, relates to energy healing. Um, and those practitioners practice in terms of Western science, but in terms of indigenous traditional science, the energy of each person is really important. Um, and the energy of the people around you can impact on you and the energy of what you eat and bring into your body, both in terms of food and medicinal plants, also impacts on your body. Um, and our elders knew this and science is catching up with that traditional knowledge. And that's my, my opinion, but that's what I've seen over the last 30 or so years of wanting to know more about the ways we heal traditionally. So I'm gonna put my phone down and just talk. I'm gonna close my eyes and, and I ask you to do the same thing. I'm even taking off my glasses. And first, we're going to just focus on ourselves and our own energy through breathing. So I'm going to breathe with you. I'm breathing in, and I'm going to hold it a few seconds, and then I'm going to breathe out. We're going to gradually build up.
In the modern world of technology, our um, breathing has sped up a lot. Um, and it's hard in the urban setting to be aware of it, but your breathing is a big health factor. And um, if you carry trauma in your body, it also is impacted, it impacts your breathing. So we're gonna breathe in for about five seconds, hold it a couple seconds and let out for five. And we're gonna repeat that four times. Once you have your breathing slowed down, what I would like you to do is just fill yourself with energy. And traditionally what we do in prayer is ask ourselves to be filled with good energy. Um, it's, it's done a lot of elders um, talk about bringing good energy in and letting go of the other energy that we need to let go of. As you do that, try to picture your an outline of your body. You might not see your whole body. You might see your head, your shoulders. Once you see something, whether it be a physical representation of your body or you see something else, you can just quietly start drawing. We're gonna breathe and do this for about 10 minutes. So until 2.50. And I'm gonna do it along with you and share what I see as well. When I do this, I tend to close my eyes and breathe again when I've lost, lost a sense of what I've seen.
So I'm going to bring us back to uh, back to our Zoom meeting. I've taken the screen share off just so that we can share if there's anybody who wants to. <laughs> this is awkward. Find my little thing that holds the phone up. Just one minute. So basically what I thought we would do next, if anybody wants to share, you can put a comment in the chat. I'll start first. So what I was doing during that 10 minutes was I kept bringing myself back to um, seeing. So seeing, um, I would say through the help of the ancestors, through prayer, through energy. And as I did it, it was interesting because the imagery transforms. So I'll just show you. Now, what I've done for years is sketches like this, and they don't all become artworks. But first, I saw myself as an outline of yellow energy with my hands down. And then the next time I close my eyes, because what I do is I draw, and then I try to refocus and refill myself with energy, good energy, of course. Um, then I saw myself with my arms above my head which since as a child, I've slept that way a lot. I also later saw some light shining from the east. I did have my neighbor's cat show up a couple of times. And I think it's because during this presentation, he's been scratching at my patio door, which I guess would not have happened if we had done this in an arts facility, but my neighbor's cats like to come for visits and my cat is over there at their place right now. So they go across the balcony railing. And so I saw the cat, the cat energy first and then him. And it's kind of weird because it was like he was standing up on two legs, like a human standing on two legs. There was a bird that came. And then I saw some other spirit, I don't know what it was, uh, that had an old hat on it at the side. So that's a basic sketch. Sometimes they become artwork, sometimes they don't. Sometimes I combine more than one sketch or more than one um, for visual reasons. And so if anybody would like to share, put a comment in the chat and we will. We have Christina, Mark. Christina would like okay. to share. Okay, great. So, so can you can you can you put her on as the person sharing? Because I don't know how to do that on my end. Yeah. Okay. Uh, spotlight for everyone. I can also rename it on. Um, I'm going to mute myself while she presents. Actually, Christina, what you could do is just un. Um, Start up your video. It should be I am on mute. Can there you see you me go. now? Yeah. Yeah. So the vision that came to me, obviously, I have health concerns, and you know, it was more I felt it was more for my left side than my right side, but I just went, I don't know if it is my left or right side. It's my arm, it's my I signified the cells with the circles. I don't know what the green means in the center. It's my heart energy, I guess. I felt like I had my spine was magnified, but there was a lot of um, the yellow light, the red light um, gave me a sense of purpose. But what the blue around my arm means is that there's a problem. I feel like there's a problem that I need to work on, but um, which I am, but I just feel like I just, these are just like the energy is, is like, I, I feel like it's a part of like the universe, the golden light. So thank you. I, I really like that process. It gave me a different sense because I never really do my body shape. So thanks. Thanks, March. It was great. I appreciate that. Thank great. you for sharing it. It's interesting for me that that came out because um, in the tr tradition of energy healing that the people that I know that are energy healers some of them can actually scan somebody's body. And I've had healers work on me several times and they've been able to um, help me heal from um, post concussion. So they've been able to actually determine like right here in your neck, you're getting a flow that's not working and then they help heal it. And it's also, um, I know some healers who, a uh, uh, Mi'kmaq healer who, when he was here was able to know when people had cancer and it was again through their energy and my, um, my ex-husband is a really good healer. He's, um, 
somebody who's helped a lot of people with different health rem, uh, health situations from infertility to you know after a car accident and it's all been through scanning them and seeing uh, energy in different ways so that was really interesting that you could actually hone in on yourself and see that there's something there that you need to work on so miigwech for sharing Lalala. we have gail would like to share So this is mine. I don't know if you can see it or not. Uh, Let me just change my thing. I think you need to turn off your virtual background, Gail. Oh, that's, I didn't even think I had that on. Yes, yeah. just a moment, please. Okay, there we go. Hmm. Oh. <laughs> there we go. So I was just thinking in terms of color and just letting whatever is going to flow through, flow through. And this is what I came up with. That's it. Thank you for sharing, Gail. I, uh, it, look, it looks like maybe pastels or something, which is probably um, freeing. I'm working really small just because I have so much I'm trying to fit on the desktop. Um, but I think working big, I've done this kind of activity with children as small as kindergarten, believe it or not. And teenagers, I did a lot when I taught high school art because it was a way for students to see things in a different way. So thank you for sharing. Is there anybody else? Mark, we have a question. Uh, what can you do to help yourself visualize if you're having difficulty doing so? That's a great, que that's a great question. And I think there's different ways. Um, and I use uh, smudging, which is burning sage and sweet grass and um, cedar. When I have my head is too full to visualize, to see things clearly. There are, um, there's actually a field which I'm going to talk about when we do writing of called proceptive writing, which is about creating a safe space and um, a space for you to uh, allow yourself to to see what you need to see. Um, I will tell you that I used to do this in classrooms with about 30 teens, and there were always a few people who had a hard time because all that other stimulation that's coming in, there's electrical currents, there's the technology, there's also the stresses you've been through in the, the days before, um, all of those could interfere with being able to visualize. So when we get to that writing, you, we're gonna try a few practices that relate to that whole thing of creating a safe space. We have a, um, we have Karen who wants to share. Karen? Karen, would you like to share? Well, I guess it's, she's not coming I through. I see her mic is, is muted. Could she unmute her mic and then maybe she's able to, and she'd also have to put on her. Yeah, I've asked her to, I've asked her to do that. Um, one second. Uh, Karen, would you like to unmute your mic? Hello? I don't know. Well, while we're waiting for Karen, is there anybody else that would like to share? Oh, 
Okay, if yeah. if she can't unmute, maybe she's still on mute from the co-host. So I will try to, I don't know if I can do it, but I'm gonna, no, it's not letting me. Are you able to unmute her? Uh, I can't see it from my end. One second, I'm going to go into participants. I can see that it's muted, but. Her mic is, uh, her mic is muted. Okay, okay I, 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 Oops. That was me. Un I thought I was unmuting her, but I was unmuting myself mm -hmm. on the computer. So I can't help, unfortunately. Okay, well, maybe, maybe she'll be able to come back later. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen again. I'll just have to figure out where it is. So what I said was, and I didn't actually tell you to do this, but you will see maybe areas of stress, strain, pain, and also comfort. The next thing we're gonna do is something that I learned. Uh, I was part of a, can, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. So I was part of a project when I taught indigenous studies at Rideau High School where they brought teachers from across Ontario to Toronto and we focused on Indigenous literature for First Nations, Métis and Inuit students. And we had training with different elders and Indigenous writers. And then we went back to our schools and we had a grant to produce books with First Nations, Métis and Inuit students. So um, the group that I, I had worked with was mostly grade nine students. I at Rito, at the time I had the lodge program, there was about 58 students who had identified as being First Nations, Métis and Inuit. And most of them took um, the Indigenous Arts course I, I, I taught at the time. So during one semester, I had a group of students do oral storytelling, writing, etc. So this activity is not my own. It actually came from an elder who lived in Toronto. And he talked about how um, in heal, helping people heal in both traditional ways and also using contemporary ways. Um, it was important for people to map out um, their memories. So what I'm gonna give you some time to do is to think uh, back uh, to a place that you lived. And it can be from your childhood, but it doesn't have to be. It, uh, we're all different ages here. Um, although the PAL is focused on over 55 and over, there may be younger participants as well. Um, and I'm gonna get you to try to visualize as much as you can and deta as detailed as you can um, a view of a building you lived in and the rooms or a neighborhood you lived in and the streets you walked on to, to get to school, to get to a job, um, a campus you might have studied on, something, some place that was significant at some point in your life, and just put in as much detail and treat it like a map, label it if you want to, um, put in um, little notes, this is where I used to walk this dog, whatever. And um, I'm going to, again, do the same thing. Um, if you feel that it's causing you anxiety to remember, because that sometimes happens, try to go back to the breathing. Um, one of the things I've noticed is that bringing up old memories, uh, whether they're good or bad, can have an impact on you. So um, I'm going to get you to try and map out. And I'm actually meaning creating a little visual sketch that you might later want to put into an artwork of somewhere you've lived. It, a map could be a map of a room, of a building, of a neighborhood, of um, a playground you used to play in, but it doesn't have to be childhood. It can be some time in adulthood too. And I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to give you 10 minutes again. So we're going to stop at 3.15. And I'll try not to talk during this, just mapping out. So actually drawing a little map 
it can be in color, it can be in black and white, but think map in terms of labeling things. Maybe you have a little sidebar um, kind of map guide that says this is where water was, this is where plant life was, etc.
So we have about two more minutes. So if you haven't already done so, you can um, label it. Just with a few words. Okay, so, oops, well, I went over, I got so busy drawing that I lost track of time. So we're going to go out of the screen share again, and if anybody wants to share, they can. I'm just reading the comments. So I'm going to get Karen, if she's able to unmute mute her, her microphone. Yes. Oh, hi. Hi. <laughs> I don't know why my other device wouldn't unmute me. But I just wanted to talk about the first um, picture. Okay, great. Since, I, since, 
since I can't figure out how to take the picture. <laughs> um, but what I saw, it was very visual and it was the sun shining down on my head. And so that's what my picture was. It was like a yellow sun with, you know, the streaks pointing down into my head and um, one arm raised up with my hand open. Okay, great. If you go to your, if you look, you might have a little camera that has a red, it's red and it has a cross mark across it, which if you click on it, it will let your camera start doing video. Karen, no. what kind of device are you on right now? Um, an Apple iPod. Okay, so if you can look and see if there's a little red camera that. Yeah, I did. I did that, but it won't let it won't let me unmute it. Okay, okay. it won't let you show the, so, the image. So I'm okay. just kind of stuck. Yeah, but thank you for describing it. That's yeah. that's great. Is there anybody that would like to share a map? I'll just briefly show what I drew. So I did a little map. Um, I made a man, um, a house uh, kind of met, well, what do you call it? The guide on a map. Uh, and I drew a street I lived at outside of Gravener's in an area that was called at that time, West Gravener's between Gravenhurst and Wata First Nation. And I put in where we went swimming. But the houses, I the ones we ended up, we were quite poor at the time. We didn't have money to, um, we didn't have the money to buy a house and my parents came up with an agreement with a developer that they could rent for a, not a high price houses until he had sold them. So we actually lived on, in three houses on the same street. The green houses are all people that I visited in their home and the black one was, this is a memory that like uh, I said trauma can come up. This was a guy on our street who was a single guy and he exposed himself to kids on the street. and. The parents just laughed at him. It was kind of weird. It was back in the late seventies and, and it was like, oh, what a creep. But then he went on to do that at the arena and he did end up getting arrested. So for my map, the homes I lived in are filled with nice pink, rosy color. Um, they were good, my parents provided us with good homes, um, but they were all on the same street and we moved many times. We would live somewhere, the house would sell, then we'd have moved like to another one, live there for a few months, um, all on the same street. The green ones were places that I went to play with friends. So that, I chose to do that. Then I was thinking, how old was I? I would think I was about eight to 12 or 13. And then my parents built a house. We built it ourselves. We actually helped build it as kids. Um, and that was south of Gravenhurst. So I'm going to go back to screen share. Is there anybody else who'd like to share? If so, put in, you could put it in the, in the chat. So the next activity we're not going to do, I was going to do it, but I think I want to leave some time for the writing activities. So um, we're at 3.20 now. We still have about 40 minutes. So well, yeah, we'll come back to it if we have time after the writing activities. So the field of writing self-development comes out of Britain. It's um, actually called writing and therapy in Britain. In Canada, there are certified art therapists. There's certified um, drama therapists, uh, but I don't know of a provincial body of writing therapists yet. I took a course through the, the uh, University of Athabasca, which has a master's program in integrated studies. And that course was on writing for self-development and it was a really intense and intensive course that guided me a lot in writing. It also um, helped me in terms of my my way of teaching um, and 
one of the interesting books in there was about uh, how writing is therapeutic. And they had actually gone with 13 different researchers, mostly in Burton. A few uh, were, were Canadian-based practitioners, a writing therapist from a hospital in uh, Edmonton was one of them, for example. Um, but there were some, some actual medical doctors who did therapy on how writing um, for the pleasure of writing and for um, your own self, purpose, your own use of for yourself is a healing modality. And they've even done um, testing of the boosting of the immune system through writing. And I think that any of you who uh, do visual arts, performing arts, you know that there's a therapeutic aspect of that practice that helps you as a human to just live life in a better way. So one of the um, books we read, which I um, related to, but also modified for my own purposes is uh, called Proceptive Journaling. And it came out of two professors who had um, left their jobs as professors to be full-time counselors. They were psychologists in the States. And they came up with a, a, a method of writing for therapy that they then created um, a center uh, that's called, uh, proce was called proceoceptive um, writing. And it's a ritualized way of writing. What I mean by that is it's about daily practice, um, morning, uh, evening, or afternoon, but trying to do writing at the same time every day. And so during that course, I did this for about five months, uh, where their method is to light a candle in order to create a spiritual space. And um, they had Bach music, which we were actually uh, we were actually given the first week I did try to write to Bach music and I decided it wasn't working for me so I changed to music that I liked and um, I've tried to write to all kinds of different music and so the music is playing and that's to try and get you out of the um, space of thinking about okay I have to get pick up groceries I have to get this done I have to do that oh, okay why did my kids say that all of those things that um take you out of a space for just pure stream of consciousness writing. And they um, had clients that did this writing at home and then brought their journals to them for psychotherapy. Um, but in the course that I was in the writing for self-development, we did that practice every week. And then we used things that came out of what we wrote to create short stories, poetry, uh, creative nonfiction, etc. So what I'm gonna challenge you to is I can't recreate that right now. What we're gonna do is um, you can, if you have a candle, light a candle. If you have smudge, smudge yourself. Um, if not, that's okay. But basically the way it works is having music playing. And I was gonna choose music for you, but I felt um, what I can focus to might not be what you can focus to. If you wanna put on some music, put it on. It's to create a headspace where you're not thinking about today. You're not thinking about what you have to get done today. You're not thinking about, you know, you have to do this after the workshop, that after the workshop, etc. And I'm going to do the same thing. And basically stream of consciousness means you write whatever comes. So any words that come to your mind, they can come in sentences, they can come in words. And again, if you want to share, you can. If you don't want to, that's totally okay. What we did in that course was we did it every day and then at the end of every week we did a summary of what had come out in the writing that we thought was interesting um, and we didn't didn't have to share the specific writing with the professor that we were taking the course with i found it really helpful i ended up doing um, a series of poetry bowls at the end of that course that i really felt good about they were ceramic bowls where i had inscribed some of the writing that came through both the proceoceptive writing and some of the other writing activities. So I'm going to give you again, 10 minutes. So 3.40, we're gonna stop this activity. Put on some music. I'm gonna do the same, but I'm not, I'm gonna turn off, I'm gonna turn my mute on and just write what you feel, whatever comes. You're trying not to edit yourself. You're trying not to stop yourself. You're trying very hard to not focus on what else is around you. If you need to have a drink of water beforehand, need to go take a quick break, do that, and we'll come back at 3.40.
So we're going to um, wrap that exercise up. I listened to two songs. I listened to a song by a Cowie, who is a musician that I've collaborated on some arts projects with here in Ottawa. He's a Mapuche mestizo person from Montreal who also lives in Chile part of the year. And then I listened to a random song that popped up after him, which was Coldplay Yellow, which was interesting. It brought me to visiting my dad in long-term care during the pandemic, which has not been easy. His, his unit's on outbreak right now. Again, um, I go in with a yellow um, robe and um, face shield, mask, get tested. I think I've been tested now oof, 28, 29 times for COVID, all of them thankfully negative. Um, so the words that came related to him, and it came through that song, listening to the song Coldplay, Yellow. This is uh, something to think about if you want to um, join us next week is taking some of these exercises and repeating them and doing them again. So I'm gonna share the screen. Is there anybody that wants to talk about what came out in the writing? You don't have to, because they tend tends to be quite personal, but if you want to, you can share. So the next place uh, that I, the next kind of space I wanted to talk about was giving yourself permission to have a place of nurturing and self-caring when you're doing writing and art. And um, what I'm going to do is get my drum. I'll be back in a second. So um, an elder that I went to, let me think, um, probably 16 years ago, came to the Kumik in Ottawa. His name's uh, Bob Borden. Recently, he's had a lot of online bullying from people who's claiming he's not actually Mi'kmaq, but uh, he is, uh, is. His grandmother's Mi'kmaq from a reserve near Mariah, Quebec. And um, he's Métis uh, from Gaspé as well. I met him here in Ottawa. And... So one of the things that I find helps me to create a space where I can focus on my writing and art is drumming. So I have been a hand drummer since 2004. I've uh, drummed with different women's groups in Ottawa and uh, used to perform, but uh, don't anymore. I might again at the future, I don't know. I just found performing took away from what I really needed from drumming, which is healing and reconnecting. So my little hand drum, this is the one I made back in 2004. I've made many others since then, but this is the one that I call my personal drum. It's, it's a drum that um, I've carried that long. It travels with me. Um, I performed in Europe a couple of years ago. I did uh, dancing um, uh, with a bunch of other people, not because I'm a particularly good dancer, but because um, there was a festival there that they invited different um, different First Nations and Métis artists from uh, Quebec. So I'm originally from Quebec, from that uh, area that is not really um, an indigenous area in that there's 11 nations that boundaries cross over the province of what's called Quebec. But we were all from originally from there. And um, I showed my artwork and I also uh, danced in the two regalia that I have. Uh, one is a high dress and one's a, a cotton dress. Both of my dresses come from visions. I did not start to dance at powwows until I saw myself in those uh, regalia. The first one's a commitment dress. It's not really a traditional powwow dress. It's an old dress that I've only seen one other person wear and I dreamt it in 2006 and then again uh, 2015, I dreamt another dress that I would need to um, make, and I'll show you a sketch in a few minutes of it. But to create a safe space, one way is through drumming. Um, the other way is, again, to have your own space. If you live with other people, you need to create a space where you can have no interruptions. If you want to do this kind of writing and this kind of um, visual arts and be able to focus on it. Um, one of the activities I did in that writing course that I took through University of Athabasca 
was um, imagining a place of nurture, a place where I felt comfortable and safe to just express myself. So I'm gonna do some drumming. Um, that elder Rob Borden uh, gave me a teaching from his grandmother. He learned to drum as a child. He had to sit um, and, and learn songs early. Now people are using YouTube. They're um, going up and um, recording on voice recorders, other drummers. They're also using, uh, I, I, I've, come, I've voluntarily gone in for, to do drum awakening ceremonies in a local indigenous group and uh, they're using words on paper. When I learned to be a drummer, that wasn't the way it was. You learned the beat and then you learned orally. And Rob Borden, um, Bob Borden, uh, who's from down home, he learned the same way as a child that he learned a song until he learned it and then maybe he'd get to learn another song. So this is just a rhythm and this is a meditation. Um, he told me I was going through a period of time of difficulty of being almost 40 and not having children. And he gave me this to help me um, deal with that anxiety that I had about not being a mother. And it's basically just trying to dr drum at the same beat as my heartbeat, not at an, uh, a heartbeat that other people might use, but my own heartbeat. And then closing my eyes and visualizing a safe place to create in. Um, if you look at the screen on screen share, you'll, are you seeing the screen by the way? Hello? Yes, No. we are, yeah. Ken? Your screen? Yeah, we can see you. So if see you. are you seeing the place of nurture slide? No, we're not. Okay, so wait a second, then I have to go out of that. You see me right now, I guess then. <laughs> okay. okay, I will drum with my drum, but the slide will be back up so you can also look at it. <laughs> Sorry. This is my first time work doing a workshop on Zoom. I have presented on Zoom, which is different than trying to do a workshop. And I've been in meetings on Zoom too. It's a challenge. Yeah, it's a different way of working. There we go. Okay, I guess when it's on my computer, I can see it on my phone. That's a new learning for me. So this poetry bowl is a series of a whole bunch of bowls I did where I was, I had taken, um, I actually took two years off of teaching mainstream and was doing art stuff. And the first year I traveled, I'd saved up money and I traveled for 13 months and I did um, an artist in residence on a cruise ship, <laughs> which is a totally different experience, but I was an artist in residence for 40 days on a cruise ship and I was teaching ceramics. So throwing um, pottery and then having um, a once a once a cruise, a glazing party where the students, the ship provided them with a little champagne and they did some glazing together. And then we had an, a little, um, uh, the last day of the cruise ship, if there was time, had a little get together again for them to get their pottery back. It was also a chance for me because I only actually taught six hours um, a day, four days out of 10. So I was only teaching 24 hours out of 10 days. I had a lot of time to use the, the facilities there. And I created a series of bowls that I called poetry bowls. So I used some of my bowls, uh, some of my poems, and I built them into ceramic bowls. And I did, I used the glaze just rubbing it in so that it stay, uh, stayed kind of uh, not shiny and bright. So the poem is on the left and it's a poem based on this activity of finding a safe place. And as I did this meditation, I often would see myself inside a big shell and I'm from the ocean beside the ocean. So my, my mom still has land right on the sea. And uh, so the whole bowl was a description of that safe space. So I'm going to drum. I want you to try and visualize. I'm going to stop talking. Try and visualize the safe space, but I'm only going to drum a little bit and then I'm going to stop. I'd like you to try and become aware if you need to breathe, 
do breathing again, but also become aware of your heartbeat. So to do that, you might touch your pulse and try to really relax using your heartbeat to guide you. And then you're gonna picture somewhere that makes you feel secure and safe because this kind of work where you're working on um, the visualization and visioning, another thing you could do is keeping a dream journal, that kind of thing. But this all requires you to feel safe where you are, where your space is, that you aren't gonna be interrupted. You're not gonna have a lot of noise, um, that it's gonna be quiet and secure. I'm going to give you until four and then we'll do a very quick wrap up. So I'm starting with breathing again because I feel like I get I get like an adrenaline, not exactly adrenaline, but I get um, an energy build as I teach. So I'm going to try and bring myself back down to calmness. I'm going to try and tune into my heartbeat. I'm going to do that by touching my um, touching my artery and breathe and then I'll turn off the screen for until three until four o'clock.
Hi again. So we're going to do a little quick wrap up. I'm going to share the screen to give you an idea of um, of what we're going to do as a follow up session. So this is a two part workshop. The second session is an optional session to come back a week later and to do some of these active type of activities over the next week and then share what you wrote or share what you drew. Um, is there anybody that would like to first share some of the writing they did? Okay, so I'll go on to sharing the final screen and then we'll we'll wrap up. So I, it's kind of weird because I can't hear myself. So are you hearing me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. So we're going to do a follow up session and you'll get a zoom link again by email. It's an optional session. It's next Wednesday, the 24th at 2pm. It'll take a half an hour, 45 minutes. We'll just see what happens. Um, I'm going to challenge you to try and find time and create a space, both physical and time space away from the hecticness of life to do some um, of these types of activities. You can repeat the ones that I've given you. You can find other activities. One thing I also do is when I do prayer, I find uh, images come to me. I get messages from the ancestors and visual images a lot. Sometimes they're really clear messages that are like verbal messages, but sometimes they're like they're in words, but often they're in imagery. I also have some pretty vivid dreams. I like to joke that I probably could take some of them and become a script writer for movies <laughs> because they're pretty vivid. <laughs> and um, that little map that I drew, interestingly, I had a dream of that street just a few weeks ago, which is probably why it was in my mind today. And in the dream, I went back there and I bought this old house that was falling down. And anyways, it was really detailed and really elaborate. So um, also, vision comes from your dreams it comes from setting up ceremony space for yourself to pray to, to uh, light a fire i have a luckily i have a fireplace in my home and i only use it for prayer fires so it's used for me to connect and um i'm just challenging you to try that and i'm going to try to find some time too we're all probably busy even those of us who are retired from our official former um work lives and then we're gonna come back and just voluntary, voluntarily share. The stream of consciousness writing, the last thing I just, I'm just gonna read out some words. Spring jump, children's voices, tall evergreens, four-legged, snow is melting, no drama, no shame, no blame. Base of a tree trunk, living inside a tree, fasting fire, tall fire, soothes me. So that's just random stream of consciousness words. Um, some other words that came out today was under his feet, no waves on his shore, TV is droning, not really a home, swabs times three, sadness, heavy heart, yellow, COVID, pandemic, outbreak, I, he can't sing but I can now, etc. That was about my thoughts, that was random stuff about my dad and the experience of him being in long-term care during the pandemic. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to challenge myself to try and either take some of the stream of consciousness writing and write a short story, maybe write a creative nonfiction, write a poem, um, or maybe do a small artwork like a six by six artwork or something based on something that came out this week. You're welcome to join me next week for a brief, um, just each person sharing what they did. <clears throat> and if people sh show up, I will be there. Um, I also would really like to thank um, PAL Ottawa for existing. I didn't really know about the organization until I saw the call for workshop proposals, but I turned 55 on December 6th and the deadline to propose a workshop was December 7th. So I'm glad to know that there's an organization for arts people because as many of you know, arts uh, workers, whether they be performers tech, uh, working behind the scene in technology, conservation, whatever part of the art world they're working in, tend to be underpaid and tend to live um, often uh, near or below the poverty line. So that there's an organization that will support people who um, 
have given their life culturally to our society um, when they're older, I think is really awesome. So I'd like to say again, Magwetch, Walalan, thank you for uh, inviting me to present today. Thank you very much, Mark. Does anybody have any questions they want to submit for Mark through the chat line? I don't see any right now. Um, I mean, if you show up next, uh, if you show up in a week, um, you'll certainly have an opportunity to to uh, present any questions you have at that time. Uh, so I'd like to uh, thank uh, thank Mark on behalf of Palo Alto. This is a really fascinating presentation. You know, the linkage between the body, the mind, the spirit, the emotion, and how we express ourselves artistically uh, is so important. And to have that um, safe space to do that, where we, you know, can put ourselves in, in, a, in a place physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, where we feel, feel free to express ourselves. That is so important. And we need to get away from all the hustle and bustle of the world, all the negativity, all the, um, all the pressures that we face every single day to really um, allow our creative um, energy to, to flow. So I thank you so much for a great presentation, Mark. Um, you'll be receiving an online survey uh, following this presentation, and we'd appreciate if you would uh, complete it uh, because it'll your your impressions of today as well as any other um, sessions that you attend of Spotlight 2021 will help Pal, Pal inform itself as to future programming because Zoom is not going away even when the pandemic is, is long gone. Uh, we'll still use it, we'll, you know, we'll be going live, but we'll still use Zoom to reach out to people across uh, uh, Ottawa, Canada, North America, Europe, UK, the world. Um, so it'll be, it'll be around for a while. Um, the this session is as i mentioned at the top has been recorded and will be put on the pal youtube channel so i would encourage you to um, check that out if if there's um uh if you, if you want to review it again and uh mark i believe your slides will be available for dissemination as well so yeah great they're already on my website and i'm gonna i'm gonna when you're done talking i'm gonna share my screen again so people can write it down that's great and um yeah so that'll be an opportunity for you to go through the entire presentation the, the video as well as the slides and when you look at the video on the youtube channel on the pal youtube channel please click like and share and uh, write any comments that you have because this is these provide our metrics of, of how it's uh, being accessed across the community. Um, the Arts Festival, as, as Marg, Marg mentioned earlier, it's a terrific opportunity to support those arts workers who are living at or below the poverty line. Um, it's a really tough business to be in. And uh, just think of a world where we don't have any uh, artist, artists at all, any you know, singers or visual artists or ceramics or dancers or painters. I mean, it would be a very, very dull world. Um, so, you know, we really, we really have to support this, um, th this field as best we can. And, uh, and we're trying to do that. That's, that's why PAL exists, not just PAL Ottawa, but other PAL chapters as well. So um, um, we would encourage you to, uh, if, you, if you can contribute to PAL, even a small donation would be appreciated. Um, also think about joining PAL. Uh, you don't have to be 55 and over to join. You can be any age to join because we're, we're really trying to get all generations involved because there are linkages in art and education and enlightenment, you know, uh, you know within the generations and between different generations. So, so it's really, really, really important. I would encourage you to check out palottawa.org. That's palottawa.org. So um, that's the end of today. Uh, this um, 
this Saturday at 7 p.m. we will have uh, another presentation, uh, our third last presentation that will be by Allison Burns, who is a, uh, I believe a graduate of Canterbury, which is where Marg taught in the past. So that'll be a, a really interesting presentation. So if you haven't um, registered for, the, for that yet, please go to the Pal Ottawa website and you can register and you'll receive a Zoom link. Um, as Mark said, there will be part two of her presentation a week from today, which is the 24th, March 24th at 2 p.m. Uh, so I hope you can join us for, for that um, to finish off Mark's presentation. So on behalf of Palo Ottawa, I'd like to thank Mark again. Do you have any further comments, Mark? Any? Thank you. No, I'm just gonna share the screen now. Sure. And thank you all for coming and I'll leave it up for a few minutes until people have disappeared from the Zoom. Okay, great. Thank okay, you. Sound good? Thanks yeah. a lot. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thanks, everybody. Have a nice afternoon.